This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 28, for April 16th, 2009, from New York City, I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm Dick DePommier. And from Western Massachusetts, I'm Alan Dove. Welcome back, guys. Pleasure Good to, to be, be here. Back. So Dick and I are in New York, Alan's in Massachusetts, and we're joined today by Eric Donaldson from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome to TWIV, Eric. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I love the show. Yeah, you're an old fan, I understand. Well, I found it probably eight or nine uh, weeks into it, and I promptly went back and listened to every one of those past episodes over a weekend. and I just fell in love. It's my new favorite podcast. Wow. Great, great to hear. Well, yeah. uh, that's a good way to get on the show, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sent some positive feedback, and the next thing you know, here I am. <laughs> well, you are, you are a good uh, candidate because you are a virologist, and that's what we have. You're a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Ralph Barrick, right? Yep, I sure am. Tell us what a postdoc is, so even though we know, many we do. Of our listeners having may been there ourselves. Yeah, it's a postdoctoral fellow or scholar. Basically, you you finish your graduate work and then you work in the lab, getting more experience, more independence, uh, becoming more of an independent investigator. So someday, hopefully, you'll be able to get out and organize and run your own lab. So it's just a few other years, a few extra years of uh, on-the-job training, so to speak. Is that what you want to do? Have your own lab one day? Yeah, definitely. Great. And you also did your PhD in Ralph's lab, right? Yeah, I sure did. I, I've taken sort of the backward approach to school. <laughs> um, I ended up here. I have kids in high school, so I, I can't really just up and leave right now. So I'm ah, sort of hanging around for a few more years. You've got roots. I read on some website that you had an interesting way of getting into uh, virology. You were a woodworker and you got injured and started yeah. reading about viruses. <laughs> I did, yeah. I was. Uh, I had a, a woodworking business. I lived in Montana. I was uh, making my living, uh, bringing in log trees and trees and building log furniture. And I hurt my back. And um, at about age 29, I quickly realized that I wouldn't be able to do that for the rest of my life. And about that time, somebody recommended a book called The Hot Zone. Oh yeah. Ah. And so I was laid up in bed. Sure. Had this book. <laughs> read the book and just became fascinated by viruses. I mean, I was just, I remember it was like two o'clock in the morning when I finished the book and I wanted to go right then, right there and find more books on viruses. Oh my. And so the next day I went to the library and checked out everything they had on viruses. I found, uh, oh, there wasn't that much, obviously, a lot of <laughs> HIV this stuff. Is true. I found Microbe Hunters, some of the classic books there at the library and just absolutely fell in love with viruses. Hmm. That's a great story. I love it. So all the yeah. listeners out there, you can always be a virologist if you want right. to do it. Oh, absolutely. And I lived in a town where there was no college. It's just a community college. So I went there for two years, then transferred on to the uh, Montana State University. And from there, mm. found Ralph Barrick here at, my, at uh, University of North Carolina. Wow. So for your PhD, what did you work on? Um, I worked on coronaviruses and noroviruses. Oh, oh both. My. Okay. Yeah. Well, both of which we've talked about on we have. TWIV. Yep. And, and you're working on the same for your postdoc? Uh, yes. Yep. Great. Well, we're yep. going to have you tell us about SARS today, which will be great. Uh, but we have a couple of stories before that. Sounds and good. Uh, the first one is a new rapid test for H5N1 influenza viruses. This is a test that can be done in the doctor's office. You go in. If you think you have flu, he or she will take a nasal th or throat wash. And this is basically a a type of test. It's sort of like a dipstick, but um, you don't have much fluid with a nasal wash, so you actually put the fluid onto a slide. It's basically a nitrocellulose strip embedded in a little plastic cassette, and within 40 minutes, you, you get a reaction if you have protein, one of the viral proteins, in your nasal wash. So this is called, normally this is an antibody-antigen type of reaction. It's like an ELISA almost. It is basically an ELISA. And the way it works is you have at one end of this nitrocellulose strip some antibodies to whatever you're looking for. And those have latex beads or gold beads, so you can see the color. And they capture your antigen from the specimen. And then it wicks along the nitrocellulose towards the other end. And at the other end, there is a line of antibodies stuck onto the nitrocellulose. 
and they will grab the antigen as well. So you sort of had sort of a sandwich formed. You have the antigen, the antibodies grab it that are stuck to the nitrocellulose, and then that second antibody with the latex bead is also stuck to the antigen, and you get a line developing on the strip. So if you have flu, you would get the line. So why does this test develop faster than previous ones? The previous ones were antibody-antigen reactions, which require longer. Uh, the antibody is, is bigger. Takes you mean done on a well series of 96 well plates or something like that? No, this is just on a strip of nitrocellulose, and you're depending on the, the antibodies to I meant to the wick. old test. The old test. The old test is also, also this on a strip. Yeah. Hmm. And the antibodies just take a long time to form the complex and to travel along the oh, nitrocellulose. This, as you'll see, this is a small, much smaller protein involved. Does this test have a built-in positive control? It does. Because yes. that's very important yes. for these tests. Yes. <laughs> In fact, just past the uh, the line of antibodies is a second line of anti right, anti-antibodies, yep. just to show you that the test is working. You would get a blue exactly. line there in either exactly. case. Right. That's very important. Mm. So my big question to you then, as a non-virologist, and I'm the physician, what do I do next? What if it is H5 H5N1? Well, let me describe the test first. Oh, I'm sorry. Because it's really a get very ahead. unique um, modification. Okay. So this is based on the fact that, so I don't know if you remember this, but we talked about this paper on TWIV, the sequences of uh, many, many avian oh, influenza yeah. strains. Sure, were that published. was just published in Science. In Science, right. Yeah, right. It just came out. In that paper, <clears throat> which I didn't notice the first time, they found in the NS1 protein, which is one of the viral proteins, they found a binding site for what is called a PDZ domain. A PDZ domain is a 80 or 90 amino acid stretch, which is found in a lot of proteins, and it binds a short sequence, which is usually in the C-terminus of other proteins. Mm. And these PDZ domains are in lots of proteins from humans, from flies, from many different organisms, and they, they're involved in a lot of processes. They basically assemble big macromolecular complexes in gotcha. different parts of the cell. Gotcha. So they noticed that there was this binding site in NS1, and they actually demonstrated that PDZ domains will interact with this NS1 binding site. So these guys in this company that developed this, they took advantage of that, and they basically substituted a PDZ domain for the antibody in this capture assay. Oh. Okay. And it's very quick because the PDZ domain is small. Gotcha. It's on the end. And it doesn't have to be refrigerated. Right. It's just to be done anywhere. Nice. Right. Um, so I think this is brilliant. Ha. Huh. It just goes, shows, you know, here you go. You sequence all these viruses. You sure. find something you didn't expect, and uh, a company yeah. makes something out of it. I really <laughs> like that. These uh, PDZ domains have very specific ligands. So they picked one that is specific for H5N1 NS1 proteins. So you could pick, you could make a diagnostic test for any influenza subtype you wanted to. Or for many, many influenza subtypes in one test. You could do them all in one test, right. Oh. But here they're interested in H5N1 because sure. they want to see if it's... You know, right. passing through the human. So it's an epidemiological tool, yeah. basically. So your question, what do you do with it? Yeah. That's a good question because you're going to get some false positives, right? Sure. You and don't want to scare people. And do who's going to do the test? Do you put it in every physician's office in yeah, the right. U.S.? Right. Or just key sentinel areas? Or only infectious disease docs? Exactly. I mean, it's designed to be, you could do this at home. I don't know if they will sell it. You know, the pregnancy test is the same format. Got it. It looks for right. a protein in urine. Sure. It's an antibody-based test, but it's the same idea. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who gets this assay because you can imagine that you don't need to routinely run it unless you have some suspicion. Yeah. But maybe in areas where there are already avian, human avian influenza cases, you know, Egypt, it sounds Asia. like it's a field test that could be in the hands of unskilled people and say, here's how you do it, just report back and let us know if it's there. That yeah. would be a very good use for this as far as I would be concerned because of my public health background. Yeah, that could be one of the uses, but uh, we'll how see. How expensive is it? I don't know. <laughs> That's the other question everybody always asks. I don't know. You know, we wish we had this test in our hospital, but it's just too expensive to run, so therefore we... I, I really don't know. I mean, of course, the pregnancy tests are massively produced. So sure. They're, they're not that, probably 20 bucks, yeah. I would guess. That's but a monoclonal is, antibody that they're using? For the pregnancy? No, yeah. no, for the uh, H5N1. No, but this is not an antibody. It's not an antibody. Oh, that's right. It's the PDZ. No, that's right. I'm sorry. It's I'm the sorry. PDZ. Take Previously, it the previous flu tests okay, were looking for NP, and that probably was a monoclonal antibody, I would guess. So it's very specific. This but. is um, this is probably quite cheap to produce, but the um, the issue is the company is going to charge a price that will <laughs> out 
recoup their That's costs right. yeah, and exactly, also exactly. bought them financing for their next five projects. So, sure. <laughs> well, yeah, like, WHO yeah. might buy it, but they don't. Yeah, have they a lot may. Of money. They may do a two-tiered pricing program. That's for, right. Oh, Eric is gone. Let's, uh oh. Let's get Eric back. Come back. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. The the Google document has now a first line of it that says, I lost. <laughs> Maybe you had to go inoculate some plates or something. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody lost. Hello? Hey, Eric. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were lost <laughs> until you wrote it out. Where did we lose you at what point? I think it was about nine minutes. We oh, were just my. finishing up on the... Oh, dear. Oh, just before we talked about this new influenza test. Oh, no, you were just about finishing that up. All right. All right. Well, we uh, were just talking about how much this would cost and oh, okay. we would use it. But as Alan said, it's probably going to be rather expensive initially so they can re recover their costs. But I suspect they'll put it in sentinel areas initially yeah. just to see. But, you know, there isn't a uh, human H5N1 in the U.S., right? Not yet. Not, Not even yet. Imported. You think you will have it? Well, you could get somebody coming from another place like Indonesia or China yeah. or Vietnam. They could bring it in. Hmm, it sounds like SARS. Ah, hmm. yeah. that's a segue. That was a segue. <laughs> well, we, we have a few more things. And that's not the that. little machine you ride around in, by the way. But it's that's the same a... principle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we will put a link to this test in, in the show notes. It's really an interesting, uh, really an interesting development. Yeah. And, and I looked up these tests. Uh, they are, have an interesting name. So the company name is Arbor, Arbor Vita, as in tree. The tree of life, I guess, Arbor Vita. And it's called a lateral flow rapid antigen assay. So I was looking this up, and it's really very clever. It's so simple, mm -hmm. and it works. So that's a test for H5N1 uh, viruses. But you could make it for any virus if they have this PDZ binding site, PDZ domain binding site in them. Uh, the second story just came out this week, and that is polio virus was isolated from a Minnesotan who died last month. I saw that one. There's very little information. Uh, this is from the Minnesota Department of Health. This fellow died, or this person died last month. I don't know the gender. Patient was infected with a virus strain found in the oral polio vaccine. And the patient died with symptoms that included paralytic polio, but it's not known to what extent paralysis may have contributed to death. And they keep saying the patient, so we don't know. Hmm. We don't know the gender. They, they have said the patient had a weakened immune system and multiple health problems, which um, mm. you know, obviously really? a number of things could cause that, including old age. But it suggests <laughs> maybe this is an HIV patient. Could be, or it could be an immunocompromised patient. Was this or, an autochthonous right? case caught within the confines of Minnesota? What's autochthonous? <laughs> From within. <laughs> From within. <laughs> what a good word. Huh? Not allochthonous, which is without. <laughs> That's why we have you here, Dick. <laughs> um, it's nice to know I'm useful for something here. <laughs> oh, all right, cut it out. <laughs> this uh, is probably, I would guess, here's my speculation, because we don't have much more information. We don't know where it's from. I think this is an Amish community case. Because, ah. first of all, this guy, I don't know how old this person was. If they got polio, they were probably not immunized, and we know the Amish don't get immunized. Right. There were, or there was in 2005, four cases of polio right. infection in Minnesota in an Amish community. Right. These were kids that who had hadn't been immunized. I would guess that this person is in in the Amish community, the same community, is immunocompromised or immunodeficient, and picked up a vaccine derived polio virus as a consequence. And we'll find this out in the coming months when they give us some more information. Mm -hmm. In 2005, the first, the first of the four cases in the Minnesota Amish community was a girl who was immunocompromised, and she picked up a vaccine-related strain that had been circulating for a couple of years, and they don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. I did a, a blog post a few weeks ago about this. A paper came out where they tried to identify the origin of that strain, but they couldn't. So it came from somewhere, but as you know, the Amish don't travel much, no. so it was probably someone who came into the community. Perhaps they were shedding the virus. Maybe they were also immunocompromised, so sure. that's what I think is going on here. So if you have an immunodeficiency when you're two months old, which is the time you get your first polio vaccine, no one usually knows that you have such an immunodeficiency, right. and typically B-cell right. immunodeficiencies aren't apparent at that age. So you get the polio vaccine, 
and then you shed it yeah. for years. And yeah. some people have shed it for 10 years in the absence of symptoms. Wow. And so they spread the virus to others. And we can tell how long the, the virus has been circulating in the community by sequencing it because it changes at a steady rate each year. Now, is there any ongoing monitoring of things like uh, watersheds and sewage systems um, yes. in Minnesota, for okay, example? Okay, so we should point out that the former state epidemiologist for Minnesota was Harry Hull. Does that ring a bell, Alan? It sure does, yes. <laughs> so he used to be involved with WHO in the polio eradication campaign. Goodness. So, and then after that job, he went to Minnesota to do this, to be the state epidemiologist. And oh, yeah. he instituted a really extensive polio monitoring program, which is why they picked up the cases in 2005 and probably why they picked up this one hmm. as well. So yes, the answer is they do extensive monitoring of water, sewage, and if they have a patient that has some, in this case, this person had polio, for sure right. they went to isolate virus. In fact, if, I, if I could interject, uh, the state of Minnesota is the most vigilant state in the union with regards to food safety as well. They have the they reject more produce from other countries than any other state because they do actual testing, which doesn't necessarily mean that other states don't do it, but they do it better than most other, other states. states. Hmm. So they're they're very acutely aware of importation and. Uh, the consequences thereof. So we will see what happens, but I, that's my guess that this is an Amish person, probably immunocompromised. I don't know the age, could be young. And it, they picked up what we call vaccine, circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus, and it was probably from someone else who had been immunocompromised and carried it for years. Right. And these vaccines aren't used in the U.S. anymore, not since 2000. So it's not used in Canada so it was from someone who's here and and excreting the virus were from a traveler. So, yep. And this is a problem because this community is not immunized. Mm. You know, viruses will be brought in this way. You bet. We have next a very interesting story about koalas. Dick, do you know anything about koalas? Uh, I spent six months in Melbourne, Australia as a, a uh, sabbatical. And I had a wonderful time traveling around the country, and I do know that they are highly susceptible to a disease that we would call chlamydia, which ah, is excellent. actually affecting their reproductive rate, and koala yeah. bears are becoming scarcer and scarcer. But I don't know anything else about them All except right. that they're cuddly little animals, but they have giant claws that they grab onto <laughs> you with. So if you hug one, they hug back and they stick their claws in your back. So I wouldn't recommend it. Actually, them. what you said, though, is very helpful. And they, and they eat eucalyptus leaves only. So I don't. That's all I know about koalas. That's that's a great deal. <laughs> Before we get to that story, we have a few words from our fine friends at Citrix. Citrix ah. is now the sponsor of Twiv. Excellent. Dick, do you feel chained to your office computer? Do you feel you have to come into work every day just to get the files on your computer? I, I, I do. I do. You spend hours in traffic. Uh, I do for many sure. Many hours. Many just hours. Just to get to your PC, you stay late because you have to work on it. Exactly. And as a consequence, you never have time for family and friends. That's part of my problem. Well, it sounds like you need go to my PC. What can I do about this? <laughs> <laughs> go to my PC lets you take your office with you wherever you go. If you had go to my PC like I do, you wouldn't have a problem. You can be productive from home or anywhere. You log on to go to my PC.com. Right. And you can see your whole desktop at work on your desktop PC. You That's can use nice. any program. You can run the program locally from wherever you are. You can get any file. You can check your email. Wow. And access your network. So, for example, I could access my labs network right. through my uh, office PC from home. This is really fabulous. So I it love is. this. This is great. It solved a lot of problems for me. Right. And I suggest any of you have this issue. Alan, you don't have an issue because you don't commute anymore, anywhere. I, I have to walk all the way up the steps to, to get to my computer. My but, goodness. Uh, so you don't need go to my PC. But for uh, those of us who work far away, uh, use go to my PC.com. And you can try go to my PC free for 30 days. But you must visit go to my PC.com slash podcast. That's go to my PC.com slash podcast. You'll get a free. 30-day trial. Check Sounds it out. Sounds great. It's really good. Back to koalas. And it doesn't upset your stomach. <laughs> uh, it's, or induce stress, which would, which would cause... I just thought us, I'd uh, add that because all the products I hear on television, and it doesn't, doesn't upset your stomach. stomach. Yeah. And you don't get your herpes viruses reactivated. I'm exactly right. right. All right. This week, I, I found this very interesting article. Uh, it was an Associated Press article, very brief, that in Japan, they have 62 koalas in zoos. Really? And 50 of them are infected with a koala retrovirus. Really? 
Really? And this retrovirus just causes um, lymphomas and leukemias, and they're yes. afraid it's going to end up killing all the koalas in Japan. So they, they had a little concern about wow. this, all right? So I got to thinking, well, this sounds familiar to me. So I, I looked it up. Turns mm. out that uh, Luis Villarreal had told us about this. In Australia, so this is a retrovirus, before we talk about Australia, and retroviruses include HIV. These are RNA viruses, which when they infect cells, make a DNA copy of their genome, which then integrates into the host chromosome. So it becomes a permanent member of the cell, right? And this has been going on for a very long time in most species. Yeah, yes. That's right. And in fact, a lot of our genome has dead degraded retroviruses, retroviruses in it. They're called endogenous retroviruses, ERVs. Yep. Or herves, human endogenous retroviruses. Herves, yes. Herves. Yeah. And someday I want to do a twiv on just that and we'll call it Herv. It'd be a great name for a show. <laughs> herves herves and splices. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, what? Well, come on. It's okay. I will be the comedic form of virology here, for, for lack of a better understanding. <laughs> the problem with herbs is that we don't know where they came from in most species. But it turns out in Australia, the koalas are in the process of being endogenized. That is, there is an infection going on, and so it gives a great opportunity to watch the process of getting these viruses into their genome. So I found an, a great review article by uh, Jonathan Stoy on this called Koala Retrovirus, a Genome Invasion in Real Time. Mm. There are two kinds of, there are two places where you find koalas in Australia, in the north and in the south. And the ones in the north are all infected with this koala retrovirus. Wow. But it hasn't yet, and it's beginning to infect the ones in the south, but there's still some isolated communities where they are virus free so there's an island called kangaroo island i've been there yeah and those koalas aren't they're not infected yet right but then inland on the mainland they're, they're beginning to be infected and what happens is the virus infects germline right. cells and then the koalas are stuck with it and then when they have babies they give the virus to the babies right so there is some migration of koalas from one part of australia to the other this also says that well, that's a good or question. Is there an we don't illicit know. Trade there may be a vector. Koala. So one of the one of the suppositions okay, is that there is a vector. I don't think there's much. So there is some transport for zoos. So they put some. Yeah, these exactly. are wild mainly, but some of them they put in zoos. Right? And then the release maybe. Or? So they could. So the ones in Japan all came from Australia, sure. and they were probably in, already infected right. when they were shipped to Japan. But not from another zoo. I see what you're saying. Koala herbs are interesting because they seem to be active. They seem to be making infectious mm. virus. All right. So it's a very interesting proposition. You can watch the ones in the South be infected. You know the origin. The question now is where did the original koala exactly. virus right. come from? We don't know where that's from. Uh, does this thing undergo some random mutation that you can sort of time it to see how long it's been there? Like you can with, let's say, mitochondrial DNA? Yeah, it does. It has a certain mutation rate. And in fact, what they're doing now, they're finding re viruses highly related to these koala viruses and other species. There's a gibbon ape leukemia virus, there's a mouse virus, highly related, and they, they're looking in various species to see if they can find the one that looks like the progenitor of these koala viruses. Currently, they're all about the same, you say, in koalas, at least? Yeah, they're very similar. Okay, but so there are differences, of course. So it's a recent they thing, mutation, they Yeah. But here's the story. The hunt is currently underway for one or more viruses from mice that are closely related to koala and for mammalian vectors that might have allowed transmission of a virus from mice to Southeast, in Southeast Asia to koalas in Australia. So that's the source. It's a Southeast Asian mi mouse that has this. Wow. Oh, my God. An invasive species in Australia? <laughs> 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 While I was there, just as an aside, they were trying to get rid of trout because it's an invasive species. And I said, why don't you start with Europeans? <laughs> <laughs> of course, they didn't go for that. So these koalas have a lot of virus in the blood, and that's not typical for a herb or any other endogenous retro. They're usually silent. So this may represent a very early stage. latent virus. We covered that last yes, time. Yes, exactly. And it, what the question brought up in this paper is they don't know whether that virus comes from other koalas or from the genomes that are in the chromosomes. And the other thing is that in the Japanese story, they were worried about lymphomas and leukemias killing the uh, koala. So the, this review article says at the end, you know, koala is being hunted. It's on the verge of extinction. 
uh, is this virus going to push it over the edge? And should we interfere by vaccination to prevent extinction? Ah. That's an interesting question, right? It is. Here's a natural process going on. Right. We had nothing to do with it sure. for the most part, although you could argue that colonization and blah, blah, blah is, is pushing the koalas out yeah. of their habitat, yeah. right? But yeah. should we interfere? What do we think about that? Have we ever succeeded by interfering? <laughs> That's my first question. And usually it's the opposite. An unintended consequence is the result of interference. But I know koala bears are also being challenged by chlamydial infections as well, lowering their reproductive ah, rates. That's the other, so this virus is thought to be immunosuppressive. Yeah. And that is, is believed to allow the chlamydial infections, which decrease the reproductive rates. So what rates, interleukin yeah. does hmm. this one depress? We don't know. 12? I mean, well, 12 equivalent know. to humans? Because that's what happens in human HIV. Don't know. Interesting. So, Eric, would you vaccinate these koalas? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's a tricky question. Fact. I mean, if, if you knew that it would work, it might be worth it. But you know I what might know. work is to kill all the koalas on mainland Australia and import from Kangaroo Island. Yeah, uninfected ones. No but one you, would go with you that. You know, the problem is, Dick, you're not going to get rid of the endogenous virus. It's the same problem right. with HIV. It's trapped. It's stuck there in the genome. So even if you have a vaccine, it would prevent new infections. I guess the old ones would eventually die off. Kangaroo yeah. Island has nothing. Nothing so far. Right. But you know, it's just a matter of time. Well, How far is Kangaroo Island from the mainland? It's not too far, but I mean, and human traffic is, of course, rampant. But koala bear traffic, I think, is limited. <laughs> so if you could prevent importations, I don't know. I believe in more of a biological control than the... And, a vaccination program, I think here you would have a difficult time proving that uh, the vaccine was actually working. Because are they getting sick? I mean, are they actually dying from this? No, the ones in the wild are fine. Yeah, it's, just exactly. the, it's just the ones in zoological parks that seem to get sick. But that's, as you would call, a monoculture, right? Absolutely. So, I don't know, a vaccine would take some time and money to develop also. Right. And I'll bet you the zoo, right. the zoo uh, form of koala bear rearing creates a longer-lived koala bear. Mm -hmm. So these diseases that you're talking about may be of an older generation of koala bears, and in the wild, they would never live that long to develop those diseases. So you wouldn't have yeah. to, maybe you wouldn't have to worry about it. You know, there's something odd about zoos in general, because, you know, a last few weeks ago, there was a chimp in a zoo in Chicago who died. He got a infe respiratory infection from a human. Yes, right. I think they pulled a human metanumovirus out of they this did. chimp. They did. Reverse zoonosis, Dick. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if we should, we should probably not um, immunize yet, but I think the whole uh, observing this endogenization is very interesting. Well, I think you'd have to justify why you're immunizing. So what are you trying to prevent? Well, if the wild, if the wild koalas are healthy, then yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah or, or if the wild koalas are at least healthy enough to reproduce and maintain yeah, a, correct. a population. That's right. Um, right. Let That's nature right. take its course. Yes. And I think the HIV vaccine project has shown how difficult it is to make a vaccine against retroviruses anyway, there so it would take go. forever. Yeah, yeah. It would be hard to justify a huge effort for a small koala population, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, our last story is something we talked about before on TWIV, batteries made from viruses. Oh, yes. This is written to chemical and engineering news even. Well, I even this saw is a this story that. came out of MIT. It's been yeah. all over the yeah, press. Yeah, yeah, you're right. right? Mm -hmm, it's been right. everywhere. And someone on Twitter said we should talk about this. Said, Twiv, talk about this battery story. We did already. So, but this is the complete battery now. Oh. They got the whole thing. So the right. last time we talked about it, they had just made the anode got it. out of viruses. So let's go back. This is a battery made from a virus, a bacteriophage <laughs> called M13, which I used to use year, years ago. Yes. Probably, Alan, you remember M13. Oh, yeah. Is that yeah, blue I did cloning, cloning with M13, yeah. So this is a bacteriophage with a circular single-stranded DNA genome. And the neat thing about this was that it has a replicative form in cells in bacteria, which is a double-stranded form, which is basically like a plasmid. You can clone a gene into the plasmid. You get phage with single-stranded DNA, which you could then sequence directly with an oligonucleotide. But the code of this virus is helical. It makes long filamentous particles that are made up... So the long filamentous part is made up of one viral protein. There are extra viral proteins at either end. So it's a long tube with a few extra viral proteins at either end. What they did in the initial paper is they put a tetraglutamate sequence into the main capsid protein of this virus. And tetra tetraglutamate has the property of binding cobalt or gold, for example, which are components of batteries. 
But they put a tetraglutamate sequence in the capsid protein, and they make these viruses with the extra glutamates. And when you mix them with cobalt they form and put them on a flat surface, they form linear arrays, much like small wires or nanowires. So in the original paper, they made a little battery with that virus as an anode, and they showed that lithium ions will travel from it to a, to a regular cathode, right. a regular battery cathode. Right. And in this paper, which just came out in science, they made a cathode of viruses too. The cathode is a little harder because it has to be very conductive. So what they did is they used the same virus, which is the M13 with the glutamate residues, and they added iron, basically, iron phosphate, mm -hmm. to be part of the mm -hmm. cathode. And they made a battery with viruses at the anode and the cathode. So at the anode, we have the cobalt oxide viruses. Right. At the right. cathode, they had the iron phosphate viruses. And it actually would, lithium ions would move between them and you get a battery. But the current wasn't enough. So they modified the cathode. So they took a second viral capsid protein, which is at one end of each virus particle. So the main capsid forms the body, and that's where the, co the cobalt binding sequence was added. But at the end, the protein at one end, they added a sequence which would bind uh, carbon nanotubes. Oh. And they actually had to find a sequence that would bind the carbon. So they did a phage display, which we don't really have time to go into, but basically finds a protein wow. sequence that will bind carbon. They stuck this sequence into the end of the phage, and these will now bind nanotubes, which are very small, long carbon tubes, basically. Right. So now you have parallel arrays of viruses at the cathode, which are joined by these carbon nanotubes, cool. which attach to one end of the particle. Oh, that's neat. And when they put lithium ions on those, they move beautifully. They got a lot of current. They say it's as, it's as good as a car battery, basically. And they only use water to make it. There's no toxic chemicals, you know. If you throw it out. Well, unless you count the, the carbon nanotubes, which we don't know. <laughs> yeah. And lithium. Yeah, nothing like a uh, car battery, though. To right, nothing out. like lead and sulfuric acid, yeah. So this is pretty cool. And in the article, um, they actually admit that um, it's a clean approach, but they're not going to really use it because you don't gain anything in terms of performance. To, to you know, set this up for manufacturing would be really costly, I suppose. Sure. And someone said uh, it's, a, it's a scientific curiosity, a chemist at uh, some institute at, in Binghamton University in New York, and he says you really need to build a higher capacity cathode to really revolutionize batteries. The point is that it's very interesting. You can use viruses to make nanomachines, right, because they are small, and they have repeated subunits, and that gives you many binding sites for whatever it is that you want. Right. And this right. is this is what they've taken advantage of here. So this is very cool. Yeah, right. The point of this the point of this is not to produce a finished product. The point is to see if you can actually engineer at that scale using something that you can mass produce very easily, it's like a proof, viruses. Proof of concept. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that they got two science papers, one for the anode and one for the cathode. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> and they get a lot of publicity too. Which is not bad. Okay, now we're going to talk about SARS. Excellent. All right. But before we do that, we have a word from the American Society for Microbiology. On May 17th through the 21st at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, the American Society for Microbiology will hold its 109th general meeting, the largest annual gathering of microbiologists in the world. Visit the general meeting website at gm.asm.org to view the preliminary program, register for the meeting, or reserve your hotel stay. That's gm.asm.org. Eric, what does SARS mean? SARS, well, SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Mm. And um, it, as if um, it had been planned this way, I just happened to check um, my email, and I got an alert with SARS just a few minutes ago, and I actually posted it on Twitter. But it's um, there's a suspected case of SARS Actually, a, a gr Chinese girl died on a train going through Russia, and the fear is that she died of SARS. Oh, my. I just got the story. I could just read through it if sure, you like. Sure, go ahead. Okay, the death of a Chinese woman on a Russian train from suspected SARS has caused panic among the passengers and media and had 57 Chinese citizens taken off the train and put into hospital for examination. A 23-year-old girl was traveling across Rus Russia with her China Chinese family. Reportedly, she was feeling unwell when she got to a train in the far eastern city uh, that I can't pronounce, Blagoveshnik, <laughs> Russian news agency said. At 8.30 a.m., her dead body was taken off the train at a station near the city of Kurosk. Um It doesn't give much details about what um, symptoms she had, but uh, they're doing an autopsy. Actually, the doctors Do in that doctors city are… In 
Right. Doctors in Kurovsk are saying the autopsy proved her death had been caused by SARS. Severe acute respiratory syndrome, but provide no information on how they made that determination. And a railroad official refutes those reports? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, this it, is a very, it very familiar. interesting story. <laughs> the news is still emerging, I think it's yes. safe. Uh, right. <laughs> the railroad official would be an expert on SARS, right? <laughs> right. The last one you'd ask. So is this the is this the first case in a long if it is SARS in fact, it, would it be the first case in many years? Yeah, it would be the first case since two thousand and three that well actually there have been a couple of laboratory cases, but mm -hmm. laboratory associated cases, but it'd be the first uh SARS death from outside sources since two thousand and three. So two thousand three was the first was when this disease emerged, right? Um it actually emerged uh, beginning in November of two thousand and two. And so, yeah, it's, it's really the first uh, newly emerging pandemic disease of the 21st century. Tell us just a little bit about the, the emergence of this, what happened. Well, the first case was reported in, it's the Guangdong province of China. It's this, one of the southernmost provinces. Um, I've been in, there. Have you? Yes. That's, that's where uh, Guangzhou is, right? Canton? Correct. That is right. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, the, an individual there uh, presented with a high fever, uh, dry cough, and uh, rapidly progressed into respiratory failure. Uh, when they looked at the chest radiographs, they found evidence of bilateral lung damage. Mm. And the interesting part of this, or the, the, the thing that alerted um, the medical folks there, was that it spread immediately to four family members who had direct contact with the patient. Exactly. And the patient was treated and showed no signs of improvement with treatment. It went on later, they uh, did a case study and found that he had had contact with wild cats and was, in fact, eating meat from uh, that had been had derived from wild uh, the wet markets in China. Mm. Um, a second case was reported a month later, and this was actually a chef in a city of uh, Haiyun, I believe. Is, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these names right, but, but it was close to Foshan City, and he worked in a restaurant. He felt unwell. But he sought treatment in a different city, and he also presented with a high fever, mild respiratory symptoms, and his lungs showed shadowing, and he progressed rapidly into respiratory failure. And his wife, two sisters, and seven medical staff were infected, all having the same clinical manifestations. This was December of 2002. And so what I find interesting is that in a lot of these early cases, they got sick in a small village and went to a bigger city to get treatment and infected more people in the bigger mm -hmm. city. That's what happens if you do these, if you move around before you realize it's an infectious disease, I suppose, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or you go to where there's better medical care. Yeah, yeah and I think that's probably exactly what they were doing. But in those, uh, the last months of 2002, there were several cases uh, that uh, sort of spread out from that initial um, case and um, in, in the Guangdong province. And, I mean, if you look at the map, it's just pretty much started in Foshan and, and spread out. But what's interesting is in Guangzhou, uh, there were 226 cases, and the, the person that was infected there was considered, and I may talk about this a little bit more later on, but was considered one of the first super spreaders, mm -hmm. um, one of those, the patients that was able to infect up to 100 people that he came in contact with after right. that. So early on, this all happened in the Guangdong province, there were 305 cases and only five deaths. But at this point, um, China alerted the World Health Organization um, and just saying that we've got some, some respiratory syndrome going on here that we don't know what's the cause of it. Right. At that time, there were 30% of the cases were reported occurred within the healthcare workers themselves. That's always an alarming statistic. And the signs and symptoms were consistent with an atypical pneumonia. Mm. And then... From, from that sort of initial um, outbreak, um, I think the major precipitating fact of the worldwide, the pandemic, was that one of these patients, a 65-year-old medical doctor from Guangdong province, had, who had treated patients in his hometown, uh, flew into Hong Kong, checked into the ninth floor of the four-star Metropole Hotel. And he had treated patients with atypical pneumonia prior to his departure from Guangdong province and was sympt symptomatic by the time he got to Hong Kong. Yeah. And if you look at that Metropole Hotel, that sort of becomes the epicenter for the epidemic strains of SARS. I mean, from that hotel, um, so obviously another super spreader, you can trace almost every outbreak in the world back to the Metropole Hotel at one, one level or another. Yeah. From Taiwan to Singapore, Italy, Canada, Germany, Vietnam. Uh, Taiwan, 
all over the place from there, 33 countries. So these are all people that were at the hotel and then traveled elsewhere. Yeah, so um, I'll give you a couple of examples of people that were in the, that motel. Um, a 48-year-old Chinese-American businessman was admitted to a, a French hospital in Hanoi, uh, Vietnam, with a three-day history of the respiratory symptoms. He had previously been in Hong Kong, where he visited an acquaintance staying, staying on the ninth floor of the hotel. Mm. A 26-year-old former flight attendant was admitted to a hospital in Singapore, with respiratory sim symptoms during a recent visit to Hong Kong, she had been a guest on the ninth floor of the same Hong Kong hotel. Uh, a an elderly Toronto woman who had been a guest on the ninth floor of the Hong Kong hotel died in Toronto's Scarborough Grace Hospital. Five members of her family were found to be infected and admitted to the hospital. And so, you know, that ninth floor of the Metropolitan Hotel seemed to be a hotbed of passing on SARS to the rest of the world. Um, interestingly, in uh, Vietnam, the World Health Organization officer Carlo Urbani, uh, a medical doctor, examined American businessmen uh, who had a known, an unknown form of pneumonia in a French hospital in Hanoi, Vietnam. That was on February 28th of 2003. March 10th, 2003, uh, Urbani reported an unusual outbreak of the illness, which he called sudden acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, and he reported this to the WHO headquarters. And this is sort of the beginning of the word SARS and where it came from, it was later right. changed to severe acute respiratory syndrome. Syndrome. In his uh, notification of the HO, WHO, he indicated that it had an unusually high number of healthcare workers that was, were being infected. So people were coming to seek help at the hospitals and passing the disease on. So he he eventually died himself, right? Yeah, yeah. A couple of weeks later, let's see, uh, the date March 29th, two thousand three. He himself was first who first identified SARS died as a result of the disease. In fact, a, one of the strains, the epidemic strains that we work with, is known as the Urbani strain in his memory. Mm. Not a good way to get a virus named after you. No, definitely not. So when at what point did we know what virus this was? That was actually. Uh, April 12th of 2003, Canadian researchers announced that they had the first, that completed the first successful sequencing of the genome of a coronavirus believed to be SARS. Mm. And then by May 1st, uh, the sequences of two other isolates of SARS, uh, two independent, were uh, published and found that it was most similar to the group two human coronavirus, OC43, but it was really a unique virus in a cluster off by itself. And then a few months later in our lab, uh, Ralph's team put together the first infectious clone of the SARS coronavirus uh, that allowed to do uh, mutagenesis studies of it. That would be your lab, right? Yep. So by the time the virus was actually identified as a coronavirus, uh, was, the, uh, was the epidemic subsiding? Um, this is April, May. Yeah, May. It, it, was, it was toward the end by July of that year. That by July it. of 2003, it was coming to an end, yeah. And there were a few, few thousand cases total globally, is that right? It was 8,096 cases worldwide. That was 33 countries, and there were 774 deaths. Mm. So approximately 10% mortality. So since then, except for the lab infections, there haven't been any SARS None, cases, except for maybe this case in Russia, if okay. it pans out to be a SARS infection. So where did this new coronavirus come from? Well, so immediately, that was the question, is where did this thing come from? And so um, I think the initial place to look was, well, then looking at the retrospective studies, the epidemiological studies found an association with animals. And so they began looking in the wet animal markets where um, you can buy uh, different animals that will be later butchered and, and eaten. And when they did a test, they only tested three animals in those markets, the civet cat, the, or I'm sorry, the Himalayan palm civet, the raccoon dog, and the ferret badger. And they found SARS in all three of those, a SARS, a uh, very similar uh, virus in those. Um, but it was civets, that uh, the, the palm civet that they found the most of and and when they looked at um, the, the civets um, in these markets, most of them were, were positive for a SARS-like virus. In addition, there were, there were several clues that led them to, the, to think that it might be a zoonosis. And that was that, first of all, they, the virus that they did isolate from the civet was very similar to SARS coronavirus. And retrospective serological studies found that no evidence of seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-related virus in the human population. So... Um, when they looked at samples frozen down to see if there were antibodies against SARS, um, there were none found. Mm. 
surveys in the animal among the animal market, the people that worked in the animal markets themselves found that they did have antibodies against SARS or related viruses uh, at higher ratio than animal traders um, out in control populations. And then uh, studies showed that early case, you know, the, the people that uh, came down with SARS early on either lived near or in one of those markets, um, suggesting that they may have had contact with an animal that had been infected. Mm. Epidemiologic analysis indicated that SARS isolates could be divided in, into three groups. The, basically, in Guan, in the early cases of Guangdong, it looked like there was a very early phase of SARS. By the time it had moved to Hong Kong, it was it had changed, it evolved to become more of what was described as a middle phase, and then the late phase are, are the epidemic phases. And if you look at where the civet SARS sequences uh, fit into a tree with those early, middle, and late human phases, you see that it looks like the civets were before the early, which gave rise to the middle, which gave rise to the later. So it looked like a progressive evolution from civet to uh, more uh, virulent strains of human. Do we know if the virus was actually growing in the civets or um, replicating in them in some way? Uh, I believe that it was. I don't know. I don't know of any um, studies where they've actually looked into it in more detail. But my understanding from the literature is that it, it does, in fact, cause a symptomatic disease in, the civet, in the civets. Yeah. yeah. So the civets are brought in from the countryside, right? From they're captured or farmed? Are they farmed? Right, most of them are farmed. So, do we think they're the reservoir of of SARS? Well, that was you know that was the question early on, um, but there were some problems with that. First of all, the fact that the civet and the human were basically the the, the difference between those viruses was minimal. They were ninety nine point eight percent identical to each other. Um, this the the civets. Um, when they tested civets in the market, they found that there is a zero prevalence for um, SARS, whereas the ones that were on the farm showed no exposure to SARS whatsoever. Right. And the fact that when you infect them with the, a SARS coronavirus or, or a civet coronavirus, they show symptoms suggested so. that these are probably not the reservoir, that they're yeah, probably exactly. an intermediate host. Right. Really, at that point, there wasn't a lot, you know, a lot to go on as to what the host might be until um, – Recent, you know, uh, 2006 and, and, and even up to today, there have been ongoing surveys in different populations. And I believe in 2005, 2006, they found a bat SARS-like coronavirus in – what's that? Of course. Bats yeah. <laughs> uh, come on. In bats, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I had the pleasure, I guess you could call it that, of a one-day visit to Beijing about um, a year after that episode. And – we were there to advise the Chinese uh, Ministry of Health as to how to handle the media for outbreaks and how to middle management uh, get involved so that everybody could uh, say, there's something going on here, please come and help. At that time, there was a, a former graduate from the uh, uh, our School of Public Health. His name was Steve Eng, N-G. And he was a, a resident of, um, of Beijing and uh, was trained in epidemiology. And I sat next to him at this meeting because he was my translator from the Chinese to the English and back and forth, half of what the Chinese were saying was not actually what they were saying, <laughs> which was very interesting to learn by just sitting there listening to Steve. But the other thing he said was that there's a lot of evidence that that epidemic, the original epidemic in Guangzhou, was caused by roof rats. Mm. Now, I don't know if you've heard any stories about that or not, but they did fingerprinting of the ropes that led between the apartment houses because there, there are four of them with a big courtyard in between. And they hung out their laundry on these lines and they went from one building to the other to make more line available to hang your clothes out. And the rats were walking along these clotheslines and getting into people's kitchens. And on the footprints of the rats... They were able to do a viral fingerprint for SARS virus. Hmm. Now wow. they may have caught it from from bats also, or but, civets in the market, or civets, or, yeah. Yeah. or vice versa. The rats are everywhere, and there's a rat eating season in Guangzhou, right. where they collect the roof rats and everybody eats them. That is interesting. I, un unfortunately, I missed that when I was there. But. That that old Monty Python bit about, I forget the movie that they made, but they had a vendor outside one of the arenas yelling, rats on a stick, yeah. rats <laughs> on a stick. <laughs> they eat rats on a stick in, in yep. Guangzhou during the fall when they reach Well, well I did proportions. learn that the proper way to prepare scorpion is to deep fry it. <laughs> uh, absolutely. So, you know, the connection between bats and, and uh, rodents 
and then the civets and then people. It's yeah, a, well, a fascinating that, epidemiology, isn't it? It it definitely is. And in fact, there's some there's some evidence in the there was an outbreak in Amory Gardens in Taiwan where they thought rats may have played a critical uh-huh. role in transmitting the disease. So I, I think and I definitely think, you know, the the fact that the civet and the human SARS is so close. Yeah. And the in and, and the bat SARS is eighty eight to ninety two percent uh, similar to the oh, human. Wow. So there's a there's a big difference there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's another intermediate host that we're not seeing hmm. yet. Interesting. You know, that there's something else. There's another piece to the puzzle that isn't fully All right. makes it difficult to understand exactly what happened there. But if you could go to China now, where would you look? Uh well, I, I think there was an opportunity missed in those wet markets when they only checked three animals yeah. out of the many different animals that were available there. <laughs> they killed them all, right? <laughs> yeah, but I think rats and, uh, you yeah. know, they've been looking in bats, but I think rats would be a good place to look. Mm-hmm. Are, are they currently surveying animals in the area still? Do you know? Uh, as far as I know, they are, but I'm, I've not seen anything yeah. recently about that. Yeah. Is, there a, is there a seasonality to the outbreaks? I mean, the sample I, size is obviously small, but yeah, one outbreak. right, right, and it was one outbreak over a period of right. months. So I don't think that you could really tell for sure. Yeah. I, what you can, what you can, could see though, is in 2003, um, there was a second outbreak in 2003, 2004, very small, and right. after that, it was it was done. And and the evidence from that outbreak suggests that it was a different. I mean, the virus that infected humans in that one was very similar to civet. Mm-hmm. And so it, some people suggest that that means that um, it was a different outbreak altogether, you know, a different emergence from civet to humans mm-hmm. a second time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, others think that, it, you know, it could be a human to civet transmission. So sure. I think there's a lot to be learned there. And that's something that we're very interested in finding out in our lab. Another question I would have for you is that in the beginning of the SARS outbreak, everybody assumed pneumonia-like transmission cycle droplets. And they took very great caution to do barrier medicine to keep the droplets from spreading from person to person, and yet the healthcare workers were still getting sick and dying. Uh, what is your take on the actual transmission cycle for SARS? Well, I think it is droplet, and it, uh, in fact, droplet size, closeness, closeness to an in, uh, index patient, um, seem to be you know the key factors. Um, whether or not that patient was obviously spewing virus through cough, coughing or whatever. But there was also evidence that, for example, in the Metropolitan Hotel, I've read a paper that was talking about the sewer system and how there may have been leaky pipes and aerosol t- aerosolized uh, uh, fecal material. And so there may be a transmission, fecal oral transmission aspect right. to the disease as well. So I don't think the, the details are fully worked out, but I think primarily it's close contact with somebody that's coughing virus and ingesting it, you know, okay. breathing it into your lungs. And the hospital that did the job the best was in Toronto, is that correct? Yeah. To contain it and everything? Well, I actually think the World Health Organization uh, pulled together an amazing team of international collaborators that helped uh, quell this, you know, from early on from in this investigation of this disease. They mm. were sending out world alerts, travel alerts, sure. uh, getting people on board, putting together an international consortium to, to um, you know, stop the epidemic. And I think they did a great job. And Toronto, the Toronto Hospital was one of the yeah. best at containing it. Otherwise, you know, if you look at the population base and a 10% mortality rate, it could have been a much worse epidemic. Absolutely. So uh, since the end of that epidemic, where did the human virus go? Do we have any clue? Well, I think it's um, safe to say that it's it's hunkered down in a reservoir somewhere. Hunkered um, down. That's right. And what could that reservoir be? Anything, right? Well, yeah, it could be bats. It's probably, if it's bats, then it's just waiting for another opportunity with the right environment, you know. I, I saw a picture of the wet markets where there was actually bats stacked on top of civets stacked on top of some other animal. And if it's, a, you know, a fecal oral from the bat to the civet and then civet sure. aerosol, aerosolizes the virus and the yep. human breathes it in, maybe that's the cycle. I mean, so it could also be that it's really gone and that we would, but maybe there could be another emergence from bats to civets to people, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that – it's hard to say for sure, but I would say that, you know, it's probably – it emerged from the reservoir into the human population and died out. And now we're just waiting and, and monitoring and trying to find out where it came from and where it might reemerge. What's interesting, though, is in this survey looking for bat SARS coronaviruses, they found – Corona, other coronaviruses from different groups and a sure. variety of bats. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I did a quick scan of GenBank before the show just to find out what different species or, of, of animals have coronaviruses. And it, it spans from, you know, the, the mouse to the whale. I sure. mean, it, 
seems like every mammal that they've tested and many avians have some form of coronavirus. Or, so it's just a matter of time before the right environment, you know, the right environmental factors are in place for another jump from an animal to an intermediate host that might allow infection of humans. Yeah. I mean, another possibility is that, in fact, there are some asymptomatically infected people walking around. We shouldn't, definitely, we shouldn't definitely. rule that out, and they're shedding virus or maybe low amounts, and then at some point it's going to hit someone and infect them, and it starts over. Yeah. So there are, there are many possibilities. Yeah, this is a great example of how much we still need to know about the way we get our parasites, so to speak, whether they're viruses or fungi or, or even big helminths. Uh, the ecology of how these things are transmitted and the environments in which we live, you don't find out that we eat civets until civets become identified as a possible yeah, source. Right. <laughs> Who the hell knew about civets until, you know, and then everybody's talking about civets. Nobody knew about raccoon dogs either, but what the heck is a raccoon dog? And then all of a sudden you find out what people are really eating and what they're collecting and harvesting out in nature and the bats piled up on top. You know, it's just an amazing thing. If you want to learn about people's habits, just travel throughout Southeast Asia. I recommend it. You'll yeah. see everything eaten, including live water bugs and all kinds of – if it moves or even if it doesn't move, <laughs> as long as it's protein, it's edible and it's on the yeah. diet. And Lord knows where these viruses uh, can, can hang out. And you're absolutely right. It's, it's out there hunkered down someplace waiting for the next – gourmet meal at some uh, local cuisine restaurant. This uh, is this is also a long-standing tradition in the southeastern United States, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know you can eat that. Uh, you know, Alan, you're getting kind of touchy here. I wouldn't go there. Well, if I were well you. hey, you know, if you're, if you're talking about Areas of the world that eat some strange foods. No, well, you know, squirrel isn't so strange. Now, come on. I, you see, I keep, telling my, I keep telling my wife that, and she just, she isn't buying it. She grew up in New York. Yeah, well. It's not bad with vinegar-based barbecue sauce. Well, there yes. you go. There and you it, go. And it makes a pretty fine stew. Yeah. <laughs> and it's protein, guys. It's protein. Come on. Yes. Yep. Now, your comments did remind me that um, – one of the things that they did was call call the civets early on. Thousands of civets were called, and that probably helped uh, reduce the yeah, epidemic. Sure. And they've also, I believe the last that I um, read was that they're no longer allowing horseshoe bats and civets to be sold in the same market. So. <laughs> oh, that's a relief. Yeah. Yeah, I was worried about that, actually. <laughs> horseshoe bats are not on my menu and diet either, but <laughs> and they never will be now. But what about the people culling the civets? Did they ever get infected and die? Um, no, well, they were probably in full containment. Because the H5N1 people that kill off the chickens, every now and then somebody gets it. Hmm. Well, so, you know, yeah, the other sad point. part about the information coming out of the uh, China at that time was that very little was coming out uh, and it was hard to get a hold of. That's so the problem. It's hard to uh, know. Yeah, it's information. But the other thing I meant to bring up was that we have a wonderful system for alerting the world to an influenza outbreak. It's WHO based, and everybody has these uh, criteria for whether or not the disease is a pneumonia or not. And SARS looked like that, but again, if you bring up this fecal-oral route as a possibility, then it could look like pneumonia, but actually be a fecal-oral route transmission cycle, or at least a, a body contamination cycle. And then mm -hmm. you will subvert this whole um, alert system by saying SARS is another pneumonia, whereas it's actually something quite different, and prevention standards sure, would sure. be totally different in that level. Uh, Eric, you had... Uh done some work on one of these bat coronaviruses, right? Right. Why don't you tell us a bit about that as the last topic for this discussion? Okay. Well, um, so we uh, basically, what I did, I, I, I do a lot of bioinformatics in the lab. And so what uh, this project was is we had the sequence information, but we weren't able to get the virus itself or um, any RNA um, from the people that isolated the virus. This is a bat. This was sequence of a bat to isolate. Bat, right? Yeah, yeah. bat SARS-like virus, coronavirus, and so we used the sequence in GenBank to generate a full-length virus, uh, broken up into fragments, basically an infectious clone, and then uh, we could uh, ligate the fragments together as a full-length cDNA, transcribe them, and then uh, transfect them into cells and get the virus out. And so when we uh, built the the bat coronavirus so that we could study it a little more in a little more detail. Uh, what we found was, and this was work done by uh, Rachel Graham and Michelle Becker, but they found that if you uh, transfect the full length bat RNA into cells, you get replication, but it, the virus is unable to spread 
from cell to cell. Uh So what we did was take just a small snippet of the spike protein, which is the part that engages with the receptor, uh, and we took the small snippet from the human strain and put it in the bat, and and what this allowed was spread from cell to cell. So it was really comes, what we found most interesting about this is just 180 amino acids out of this 27,000 nucleotide genome is all that's necessary. In fact, it's just a handful of those amino acids that are necessary for cross-species transmission from bat to human. So it's, it really seems to focus on a very small part of the, the virus itself that uh, would allow a jump from, say, mm-hmm. bat to human or bat to civet. Interesting. So do you think that the the block involved receptor recognition or some other step of replication? Uh, yeah, I, we think that it did. It was receptor because uh, recognition because just the change – I mean, that's just a very, very small part of the receptor binding domain that was changed that allowed infection of the cells that were, it was previously refractory infection. Do we know what the receptor for the bat uh, SARS is? I don't know. We don't. I mean, there's some speculation that it might be ACE2, um, angiotensin 1, converting enzyme 2, uh, which is, it's been shown to be for a human, but I don't think that's the case at all. The receptor binding domains between the bat SARS and the human SARS are very different. There's a, a lot of insertions and deletions that have occurred, and it makes the, the structure look significantly different. So I think it's going to be a respiratory receptor somewhere found in the bat that's – and how it changes from using that cellular receptor to ACE2 is going to be an interesting uh, study over the next few years, I think. Hmm. Wow. Great. Okay. That's great. I have one more question for you, Eric, and that is sure. that if you had to choose between two careers, which one would you pick, virologist or furniture maker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll tell you, I, I'm living a dream right now. I mean, I, being a virologist and, and actually I, I go home, I, I read through some of the notes where uh, an email said that there's not enough hours in the day to learn, and, I, and that's exactly how I feel. I just love this stuff. And Well, I, you're, you're a classic example of somebody with insatiable curiosity. And uh, I'm very impressed with uh, how far you've come and, uh, and where you're going, as a matter of fact, too. Oh, well, thank and, you. And by the way, your, uh, your resume sounds very much like a, a very, very famous virologist named Maurice Hilleman, <laughs> who, <laughs> who, who was apparently originally a, a J.C. Penney salesman, I That's think. Right. And, That's right. Uh, and from Montana. <laughs> very cool. Hmm. Well, so. you can do anything. If you have curiosity, that is a big part of it, right? That's Absolutely. Right. You bet. Let's read, the good work. Uh, let's read a couple of emails and then we'll uh, get on to our picks. Just a few. Pat writes, I enjoy your podcast and always learn something new. I want to put in a plug for libraries. You sometimes refer to books that are out of print, like Conspiracy of Cells, but you never say, go to the library. I bet this book is there. I work in an academic library, and if we don't have it, we'll get it from another library. Keep up the good work. Very good point. Excellent. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm sorry. We should. I'm always talking about going to Amazon or Barnes and Noble. But All right. Yeah, go to your library. In fact, the book today we're going to pick is out of print, and you could probably find it in the library. So thanks, uh, Pat. Well, and Vince, you and you and Dick right now, I believe, are upstairs from one of the uh, greatest medical libraries in the world. If they they haven't changed it. Well, they have a little bit, unfortunately. Oh, okay. They've deacquisitioned all the uh, rare books and put them in the downtown campus. But oh, uh, that's unfortunate. It but... is, it is. But uh, they're still on at the university. They're still available, yes, and you good. can still go okay. to see them. Unfortunately, Alan, I rarely go there. Yeah. <laughs> Hardly <laughs> anybody I, does it anymore and, because of the, the old, electronic uh, devices. When I got. when I came here, I used to go down there all the I time. I lived in that library. And there's nothing better than going way down below and finding an in old the stacks. book in the stacks. Oh, that's great. Where the lights are on timers. That's right. Mm-hmm. And you sit down and there's no one there and you just get lost in virology. Mm. And there's, there's something to be said about it. No question. But I think that'll be gone at some point. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that, but I think you're right. Nick writes... Hello, Twivers. I'm a first-year microbiology student at the University of Iowa. During the extreme virology segment, you discussed the relatively new data supporting the idea that Sputnik virophage is inhibitory to mammavirus replication. Research at the University of Iowa has shown that infection with GB virus C in individuals infected with HIV result in a survival increase. Are you aware of any other co-infections which lead to the suppression of one of the infecting viruses? Yeah, there are quite mm. a few. If you co-infect cells with VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, and polio, VSV doesn't replicate. Polio totally inhibits it. We've done adeno, 
polio co-infections. So there are many examples, and it depends on what the virus does to the cell. If the virus shuts off a lot of things that the other virus needs, then you will get inhibition. Of course, then there are examples of co-infections which make things worse, like hepatitis delta and hepatitis B virus. So it can go either way. So yes, there are. I don't, in terms of pathogenesis, I don't know of too many, though, but certainly just replication there are. Many examples. Couldn't you imagine, though, a, a, a non-virulent a form of a virus inducing interferon, which would then interfere with Absolutely. the replication of a virulent, virulent Absolutely. virus that could sure. save your life? Could. We don't know everything that's going on, we Dick, right? Not. We do not. We do not. Ricardo just recommended an iPhone application to us. It's called iMole Builder. And this is a uh, structure display app for the iPhone or, I, or iTouch. Oh, cool. It looks pretty good. Thanks, Ricardo. And then our last email is from a guy named Eric. Uh, uh, a different Eric, or maybe <laughs> the same, same Eric. Eric. Oh, it's the same, same Eric. Eric. Oh, I don't know. So Eric, it's a double right. dip. It's a double dip. It's okay. <laughs> I was particularly interested in your discussion of norovirus outbreak that closed Babson College recently. Noroviruses are among my favorites and one I've studied extensively. In the discussion, you hit all the reasons noroviruses are so difficult to get rid of, including one, extremely stable capsid that is resistant to freezing, heating to 60 degrees centigrade, disinfection with chlorine, acidic conditions, vinegar, alcohol, and high sugar. Two, norovirus infection requires very low infectious dose of less than 10 virions per individual to infect 50% of those individuals. Whoa. And three, the symptomatic stage lasts for 12 to 48 hours, but viral shedding can continue for up to two weeks after symptoms abate. These factors make this virus a public health nightmare. Yes. In addition, norovirus immunity is a very controversial topic, with many in the field still not convinced that long-term immunity is generated upon infection. We believe that long-term immunity is possible, but that the virus utilizes two mechanisms to escape. First, changes in the viral capsid allow escape from the memory immune response, and second, receptor switching may allow the virus to infect previously resistant portions of the population. Population susceptibility is mediated in part by polymorphic expression of histoblood group antigens, which are ligands that noroviruses bind to and may be the receptor. The lack of cell culture systems in small animal models provides significant obstacles to answering many questions that remain about this virus. It's a very intelligently written letter. Good I might guy. Add. We should have this guy on <laughs> Twitter. Right? I, you know, <laughs> who is this, Eric? <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a lighter note, Dick, this is for you. On a lighter note, Dick keeps insisting that neuroviruses were originally found in Norwalk, Connecticut, and that this town changed its name afterward. The virus is actually named for Norwalk, Ohio where an outbreak sample was isolated, and a virus isolated by A.Z. Kapikian. He writes about it in the following paper, and we have a link to the paper. I sit corrected. Also, Dick, the town of Norwalk, Connecticut, has not changed its name. No, no, I meant they changed the name of the virus. Ah. So that it didn't reflect on the town of Norwalk. Because <laughs> <laughs> it used to be called Norwalk Virus. Yeah. I didn't mean the no, town changed There's actually still name. one strain that is. one. No, but they found that there's so many more strains that, it, you know, norovirus is more fitting for the virus in general, sure, the family. Sure, sure. And anyway, it's Ohio, not Connecticut. Okay. So, uh, it okay, is Ohio. Okay. And uh, he also, he attended, uh, Eric, this Eric Yeah, fellow. I attended a, a uh, the Khaleesi virus conference where several norovirologists had gone to Norwalk. Uh, Ohio and, and take, had their picture taken at the school where the vi virus was isolated. Okay, so. okay, okay. Yep. And then he says, keep up the great work. I love the show and look forward to it every week. You going to listen to this show, Eric? Uh, yeah, I probably will, and I'll probably be more critical this time than I would be. <laughs> and then from a previous email of Eric's, which I had forgotten to read, ah. in the dengue episode, Dick mentioned that humans are the only reservoir for dengue, but there is a sylvatic cycle which right. includes other primates. You guys uh, had already corrected that. Oh, we yeah, did? We had, we had, yep. Yeah, we had. Yep. Yep. Uh, one more. It's a moving target here, Eric. You'll have to realize it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm part of the moving target. When, when you teach, you will, you will know this in spades, I can tell you now. <laughs> That's true. One more, one more email from Inio. Hello, gentlemen. Is he talking to us? I don't know. Huh? I work in IT but came across your podcast listening to the re recent Futures in Biotech episode. I must say that I'm a huge fan now, and I'm trying to catch up on episodes. A few years ago, there was a lot of concern here in Toronto with West Nile virus. Oh, yeah. From a common person's perspective, your podcast gave me the information I really needed to understand what was happening far and away better than traditional media could provide. You're doing a great service. Please keep it up, and I'll definitely recommend this to my friends and family. Thanks, guys. 
Yeah, we're not traditional media, that's for sure. No. This is the new media. <laughs> that's right. Our picks of the week. Alan, your science blog is a pick. Go ahead, tell us about oh. it. Oh, oh yes. Um, so it's a it's a news blog. Um, it's not uh, not essays and commentary. It's just uh, breaking news, and it's called uh, the Great Beyond. This is one of the one of the nature blogs, and it features news that um, for the most part nature didn't get to in their regular magazine. So they they post it there. You know, hey, you know, here's some stuff that was reported elsewhere. Believe it or not, useful news comes out in sources other than nature. <laughs> it's it's just good. It's a good sampling of things that you might have missed from the world of science. Mm -hmm. Good. I missed that one. I'll have to check it out. Uh, science podcast of the week is called Sorting Out Science, sortingoutscience.net. It's science for people who never knew it could be interesting. <laughs> I guess there are some people who think science might not be interesting. That doesn't include us, but I uh, have had it on my uh, iPod for a while. It's, it's one fellow talking about all different topics, and he does a good job. <laughs> I listened to him talk about Pluto recently and was quite good. I don't know much about Pluto. Science Book of the Week is called A Slot Machine, A Broken Test Tube. It's the autobiography uh -huh. of Salvador Luria, who is a very well-known virologist. He's deceased, but he won the Nobel Prize for fluctuation analysis, which is a theory of how mutations arise. And uh, this is his story. And he actually spent some time here at Columbia after coming over from Europe. So it's out of print. So I would suggest you go to your library and see yes. if they have it. right. And if they don't... If, if they don't, talk to your librarian and see if they can get it through interlibrary. That's right. Yes, they, I'm sure they'll be able to get it for you. It's yeah. a good book. It's uh, really scientifically heavy. He talks about oh, yeah. how he came up... You know, he went to Las Vegas and he was doing slot machines, and that's how he came up with this uh, <laughs> jackpot theory of mutagenesis, which is right. why it's called the jackpot theory. And Monte Carlo this figures into there exactly. somewhere, too. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's our book of the week. And Alan, you have a cool video you want to tell us. About. Yes, I, I put this out on Twitter, um, and uh, this uh, it's a rap video um, <laughs> called "Regulating Genes." Saw it. Uh, yes, <laughs> saw it. Oh, Alan, that was so good. Yeah, it's fun, and the guy. I liked it. I liked yeah, it. It's a um, molecular biology uh, professor. I forget what <laughs> university he's at, but he's he's put together about a half dozen videos on various topics, and this this is the one about gene regulation. But you can link on YouTube from it's there to his other. Very cleverly done. Okay, we'll uh, put a link. I have to can't check, wait to check out. it out. Yeah. Yes. I haven't done that. So don't forget, you can find other science podcasts. At, there are two sites I know of, sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com, so check those out. TWIV, remember, will be live at ASM in Philadelphia on May 19th, 2 p.m. It'll be live streamed also on the internet. Me, Dick, Alan, Raul Andino will be there, so check it out. It should be fun. About eight of you have written I, uh, reviews for us on iTunes. And, Keep up the uh, good work. Yeah, yeah, thanks very much. We appreciate it. We're trying to move on to the featured front page of iTunes. We couldn't get there yet, but we're moving up. Um, we'll read some of those at a future show. Uh, you can follow TWIV on Twitter, of course, P-R-O-F-V-R-R, -R, or Alan Dove. Um, Eric, you have a Twitter handle? Yeah, Viral Nerd. Viral Nerd. Viral yeah, good nerd. one. <laughs> Dick, you have a Twitter yet? Nah, I'm old school. I'm definitely yeah. old school. You just like have... to talk to people, right? I do. Okay. Well, that's, we appreciate it. You're good at it. Better than I am. <laughs> That's not true. We had a link contest here at TWIV to win a copy of Principles of Virology, and the contest is over. Next week, when I'm done with my grant, I'll announce the winners. Yeah, I know. Dick, you want a copy, too. I do. And I'll be it's dangerous. independent of the link contest. Once I start to read it, I'll become dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Send us your questions, always. TWIV at TWIV.TV. We love to answer questions. And yeah hear what you we want us to talk about, give us suggestions, and so forth. Remember, we do have a website associated with this podcast, twiv.tv, and there are all the show notes, the links, and everything. So if you want to learn more, go there and visit. And, of course, we are on iTunes. Do subscribe so each week you can automatically receive the latest episode. And we will be back next week. Yes, we will. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, the podcast about all kinds of viruses. Thanks, Eric, for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Loved it. Dick, thank you. My pleasure as usual. Alan? Yep, always a good time. See you next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>